thank you to Markham Public Library for hosting me tonight, and and thanks to you for uh, for joining us and and anyone who might be watching the recording later. Uh, I do realize that I'm drawing your attention north at a time when many of you are probably thinking instead to the south and and warm sand beaches and and sunshine. Um, so thank you for for coming north with me for a minute. Um, as my my um, title slide says, I'm going to be taking you specifically to our northern boreal peatlands, this incredible natural heritage that we're fortunate to have here in Canada. Uh, talk a little bit about how climate change is transforming our northern bo boreal peatlands and, and why that matters to us here in southern Ontario. Um, the, the picture that I've got here on my title slide is a picture that I took uh, from an airplane while flying over a northern boreal peatland complex in the southern Northwest Territories, a, a region called the Date Show. Uh, I've been working there for over a decade. And, and this is a pretty good you know, overview of what a, a northern boreal peatland is. You can see, of course, the, the, um, the mosses in all of their vivid colors. It looks spongy. If you were to, to walk on it, you definitely want the chest waders because the water can, can come right up to your waist. Uh, those spindly trees that you see there are the, the iconic black spruce trees that are, are prevalent across northern boreal peatlands. And the, the black area there um, that blackened area is a fire scar. So fire and, and the boreal forest have always gone hand in hand. Fire is really important to the boreal forest. But that relationship between fire and the boreal forest is changing as a result of climate change. And that's something that I'm going to talk about today. And, and the title alludes to it as well, fire and ice. If you want to talk about climate change in our northern boreal peatlands, you need to talk about fire and you need to talk about permafrost. And so that's what I'm going to to introduce you to tonight. There we go. Uh, before I get started, maybe give you a little bit of, of background about me. Um, as mentioned, I, I am an associate professor in the Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change. Uh, my, my areas within the faculty that I work under are geography and environmental science, and my specific areas of, of expertise are in freshwater science. I'm a limnologist. Limnology is basically oceanography, but for lakes. Uh, I do a lot of work on water quality issues, um, a lot of work on, on climate change. Climate change is uh, one of the, the main concerns for water quality right now. Uh, and because I work on climate change, I spend a lot of time working in high latitude regions, uh, in particularly in the Northwest Territories. So if you want to study climate change, the Northwest Territories has warmed faster and, and of a higher magnitude than any other uh, jurisdiction in, in Canada uh, and, and really in the world. It's one of the fastest warming regions in the world. And so if you want to, to see the effects of climate change, you know, that's, that's where you go. And so that's where I've spent a lot of my time, though I've also done some work uh, here in, in Southern Ontario, a little bit in Northern Ontario, the Maritimes. But again, if you're a researcher who studies climate change, you look North because that's where, where you really see the effects of climate change, where it's really, really hard to ignore. Now, when I was first asked to uh, to give a lecture on climate change, I really didn't need to think that hard before deciding on what exactly I wanted to talk about. Um, fire, permafrost, peatlands, first thing that came to mind. And you know, partly that's because that's what a large focus of my research program is, but it's also a little more personal than that. Uh, just a few months ago, in late October, the field station in the Northwest Territories, that's a focal point of my research in a place where I had planned to spend a fair amount of, of time in 2023, uh, it burned to the ground in a freak late season um, severe wildfire. And so this picture here uh, of, of Scotty Creek after the burn, this is one of our, our, our um, research instruments, a tower that, that kind of measures um, atmospheric conditions. So it, it, the fire kind of swept through camp in late October and pretty much nothing left. So it, it was a little bit shocking for us. 
uh, because you don't expect fires in late October in the Northwest Territory. So there's a quote here from, from my friend and colleague, uh, William Quinton, who's a professor at Laurier University and the founder of the Scotty Creek Research Station. Um, can't escape the irony here, there should be snow on the ground. Um, fires don't happen of this magnitude. We don't expect them in late October. We expect that that fire season is largely ended by that. And it's very, very challenging to fight late season wildfires. Uh, this is a, an important research station. There's infrastructure around. There's a there's um, impetus to, to fight fires that, that threaten Scotty Creek. But what happens when a fire happens in October is you have sprinklers set up around the site. But when the ground freezes, those sprinklers stop working. You can, you know, you can scoop water up from the lakes and dump it on a fire, but you can't do that if it's late enough in the season that the ice is starting to form. So, you know, we we um, have a field research station that is largely dedicated to studying climate change in the boreal forest that burns to the ground in a fire that that is largely uh, can largely be linked to to climate change and the changing fire regime that we are seeing in in the north. It's one of the many realities that communities in the north are now facing as as everything they know starts to kind of change around them. Now here's Scotty Creek in uh, in happier times. This is what the camp looked like before the fire. Uh, we had a couple larger tents, kitchen tent, science tent, um, and then several tents that that people would sleep in. You can see quite obviously here in the picture that, that this is winter and you can see the snowmobiles and you can see the people out at the site. This is a camp that is capable of of hosting people year round. And, and I was supposed to be there uh, in February helping out with a field course that would bring uh, high school students from, from the Decho communities together with university students to learn about, about permafrost, to learn about the boreal forest. Um, we, sadly, that will not be running this year, but hopefully next year. Uh, the Scotty Creek has been, um, it was founded in, in the late 1990s as a long-term ecological research site to study permafrost and its effects on, on water resources. And it's located in a very strategic part of, of the boreal forest. It's located, uh, if you can see where that red arrow is pointing, we're in the southwestern uh, Northwest Territories, just at the boundary of uh, between the sporadic and the discontinuous permafrost zones. So permafrost is defined as, as any ground that remains frozen for two or more consecutive years. So it doesn't thaw in the summer, it, it stays frozen. And um, continuous permafrost, these areas shown in, in dark blue, this is a map showing the extent of permafrost within the boreal zone. The areas in the dark, dark blue is the continuous permafrost zone. So this is where virtually all of the land area is underlain by permafrost. Uh, the slightly less dark blue, that kind of more royal blue color, that's the di extensive discontinuous permafrost zone. So here about 50 to 90 percent of the land area will have permafrost. And in that light blue is the sporadic discontinuous permafrost zone. So here it's 10 to 50 percent of the land area has permafrost. So Scotty Creek is right at that transition from sporadic to extensive discontinuous. And this is significant because the permafrost boundary is moving northward. So Scotty is, because it's at the southern extent of permafrost, it's highly vulnerable to permafrost thaw and loss of permafrost. And some of the most recent work coming out of, out of Scotty and other areas suggests that this area will be permafrost free by 2050. Uh, what does this have to do with an October wildfire? Well, we know um, very well, it's very well established that fire accelerates permafrost thaw in, in the sporadic permafrost zone. So we say Scotty Creek will be permafrost free by 2050 based on modeling. Things like large scale forest fires can kind of throw some uncertainty into that. It might occur much, much quicker. Um, but it also means that, you know, when we're thinking about the impacts of the fire to Scotty Creek, there's the impacts to the infrastructure that needs to be rebuilt. There's the immediate impact of the fire on, on the water resources, on um, greenhouse gas emissions from, from burning biomass. 
But then there's the long-term impacts that are going to happen more slowly and over kind of longer time scales that, that are going to result from the, the effect that this fire is going to have on the permafrost. The land is going to start to transform itself. And in northern boreal peatlands, permafrost law largely looks like this um, picture that I have here on the right. It, you see those drunken trees kind of sticking out at funny angles. So fire and permafrost thaw in northern boreal peatlands commonly causes spruce forests to convert to wetlands. So the ground subsides when the permafrost thaws, the ground kind of caves in, uh, the soils become wetter, it's now too wet to sustain trees, the trees die off and it converts into a wetland. So this is already happening around Scotty Creek. It's been studied for uh, for decades and, and it's expected that the fire is going to, to accelerate that process and we're going to see much more of these drunken forests um, over the coming years. So why does this matter for, for Markham? Why does this matter for Southern Ontario? Well, we may not think about it very much, but we are uh, intricately connected to the North through, through a variety of, of mechanisms, political, social, um, and, and biogeochemical. So if we're thinking about climate change, um, what happens in the North, what happens in Northern boreal peatlands, what happens at Scotty Creek, matters for global climate change because it is going to connect to, to these global biogeochemical cycles. It's going to stimulate processes that influence um, greenhouse gas emissions from, from the land surface into the atmosphere and potentially um, amplify or, or accelerate climate change. So let me walk you through that a little bit. Uh, this is the only graph that I have in the entire presentation. Um, I personally, in the evenings, don't have much capacity to absorb complex uh, graphs and lots of squiggly lines. So uh, I imagine at least some of you are the same, and I try to keep it that way. So this is the only one, and I'm going to walk you through it. Uh, this is an ice core record from the Antarctic going back about 350,000 years. So if you look at the, the kind of x-axis along this plot, as you move from left to right, you're going from past to towards present day. And it's showing um, temperature and atmospheric carbon dioxide over glacial interglacial cycles. So over the last 2.0 million years, Earth has been um, has undergone predictable and repeatable cycles between ice ages and and not ice ages, interglacials. We sometimes we refer to this current period of time we're in as the present day interglacial. And if you look at this graph, you'll see the atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide concentrations are the blue squiggly lines, and the temperature record is the black squiggly lines. And if you look at this graph, you can see they're going in lockstep. You know, not surprising. You, you, I'm sure all heard about this. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. It traps heat at the Earth's surface and contributes to warming. So you might be looking at these squiggly lines and thinking carbon dioxide increased and it increased temperature, just like what you would see in, in you know, what's currently going on with anthropogenic or, or human greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but I'm going to tell you that that's actually not the case here, that it's actually flipped because temperature changes over these glacial interglacial cycles, um, ignoring the current period of, of um, anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. We're just going to put that aside for now and come back to it. But these glacial interglacial cycles, they're caused by changes in the Earth's rotation around the sun that influence how much solar radiation hits the northern hemisphere in the summer. So if the summers are not cold, are not hot enough to melt the, the snow that built up over the winter, and that happens successively year after year, glacials, uh, glaciers form. Um, so that's what caused these temperature changes. So why then is atmospheric carbon dioxide increasing in lockstep? Well, what's happening is it's a feedback. We call it a feedback mechanism. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But as the temperature rises, that warming temperature stimulates changes on the land surface that influence or, or cause uh, carbon that's been locked away in soils and oceans and lakes cause that carbon to be released back to the atmosphere. So temperature changes cause changes to the land surface, which release 
carbon that was stored as greenhouse gas, and that amplifies the warming effect. So in these, these glacial interglacial cycles, you have the temperature change first, and then the carbon dioxide change, and then the temperature change. Now, with human-caused uh, climate change, where we're seeing um, we had carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases in general increase first, temperature increases, and we're expecting now that those temperature increases will stimulate further greenhouse gas emissions from the land surface. Um, that's a bit of a mouthful, but hopefully you're, you're following me there. Um, one thing that I want to point out before I, I continue to build on this is, is um, if you're looking at this graph and you're looking at that zero line, and I've just told you that's moving towards present day, you're probably looking at it and thinking um, carbon dioxide is not that much higher than it was in the past. It really doesn't seem all that different. Well, that's a function of the scale of this graph. When you look at 350,000 years, the present day is like this last 150 years where we've seen that really accelerated rise in carbon dioxide. Um, that's not showing up on this plot. That if we were to continue, what you would see is something like this. It would go straight up after that kind of plateau. So current atmospheric carbon dioxide levels are at about 417 parts per million. Um, this graph here, the scale is only going up to 300 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide. So they're much, much higher today than they were over these past glacial interglacial cycles. Okay, so again, human-caused climate change. I just want to, to kind of set the record straight here and just clarify, because um, sometimes it's it, it seems natural to me, but sometimes I'm surprised at how, how much um, people still think there might be a question of whether the earth is warming and whether it is caused by humans. That there is, yeah, pretty much universal consensus that yes, the climate is warming, and yes, we are the cause through uh, through greenhouse grass and gas emissions. Uh, I think greater than 99% consensus in, in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. Um, and it's really, I, I don't think I can emphasize enough how, how rare it is to get greater than 99% of academics to agree on any one, one thing. Um, we're we're kind of a, a an argumentative bunch. Um, there's not much um, tendency to uh, to kind of go with the flow and agree with one another. And and we really we really argue over the most pedantic things. I, I know this firsthand because we just formed a new faculty at York, and we had to make a whole bunch of of seemingly mundane decisions that were were debated over over meeting after meeting after meeting what the faculty should be called what our our i don't know letterhead should look like <laughs> we don't we don't agree 99% consensus on on greater than 99% consensus on anything is really quite quite astounding so that will um in our case again we're we're in the current period of climate change we have increasing greenhouse gas emissions, temperature increases follows. But what we learn from those glacial interglacial cycles, again, is that we can expect that this warming of temperature is going to stimulate further greenhouse gas emissions from the changing land surface processes. So as scientists, we're trying to learn what some of those processes are that are involved in, in those kind of parallel trends in carbon dioxide and temperature over these interglacial glacial cycles, uh, because that's going to help us understand what happens in, in future. As we bring our own emissions down, um, how do we, we um, manage our natural resources to try to mitigate some of these impacts? So basically what I'm talking about when I talk about this link between temperature and carbon dioxide and, and land surface processes, that's a feedback loop, a positive feedback loop. So a positive feedback loop is a cycle that amplifies change, that makes change occur faster. Um, one of the probably um, best examples of a, of a positive feedback loop and climate change, and it's one of the reasons why most climate change, there's such a, a climate change research presence in the North, is, is the, um, we call it polar amplification. So the North is, or was, uh, largely covered in, in ice and snow. Uh, ice and snow have what we call, uh, well, they're, they're reflective. So the, the solar insulation that's hitting the Earth's surface, um, if it's hitting a light, something that's light in color, it's going to be reflected back. 
as opposed to something that's dark in color that's going to absorb the heat. You know, nobody wants to walk around uh, asphalt with bare feet in the, the you know, in the middle of a heat wave. That's, that's a similar idea. Dark surfaces absorb more heat. So as the temperatures rise and the ice and snow melt, you have um, less of that light being, or less of that, that solar radiation being reflected back in. So that's gonna amplify the temperature effect. So the temperature rise is gonna occur faster because of that. So it's gonna be, be a stronger magnitude and it's gonna be quicker. That's a positive feedback loop. And the flip side of that is a negative feedback loop. Neg negative feedback loops slow down change. They mute change. Um, for example, you know, we expect sea level rise with climate change. But what I think people forget sometimes is that um, one of the biggest problems that we have is, yes, sea levels are, are going to rise. And at the same time, we have um, degraded our coastal wetlands that would have given us some resilience because coastal wetlands would feed into one of these negative loops. Um, coastal wetlands can regulate coastal flooding and they could mitigate some um, degree of that sea rise in sea levels. That would be a negative feedback loop. It's something that's, that's muting change. So again, we want to understand how these feedback loops work so that we can, we can better understand what we can expect in, in future under different um, emission scenarios. And also so that we can work with our natural environment to, to put ourselves in, in the best possible position to, to weather what's coming in the future. Now to link this back to, to permafrost thaw to the north, um, one of the most um, one of the feedback loops of greatest concern when it comes to, to greenhouse gas emissions is, is this feedback loop caught with permafrost thaw, the permafrost carbon feedback loop. Now permafrost soils, they're frozen, they're so you you don't have um, decomposition occurring. The, the, carbon that is stored in the permafrost stays there. They're, the microbes aren't working on it. They're not breaking it down. They're not releasing it as greenhouse gas. Now, when the temperatures warm and the permafrost thaws, now this previously frozen material is available to be decomposed. That carbon that was previously stored is now available to be worked on by microbes and re released back into the atmosphere as greenhouse gas. Um, and, and again, it, there's a, a sort of global effort of scientists working to understand this permafrost carbon feedback loop because it's very important to modeling future climate scenarios. So the, the I lied, I have one more graph here. Uh, this is just a, a, an example of different um, climate change modeling scenarios. So you, you decide, you know, what, what would happen if we set um, an emission cap of, of this level, you know, small, low, medium, high, what kind of, of rise in, in global temperatures can we expect? So those are the lines, the, you have the different levels there, um, high, medium, low, um, and then the shaded areas around those lines, that's kind of the uncertainty interval. And processes like this carbon, permafrost carbon feedback play a lot into those uncertainties. It's important to um, get a handle on these feedback loops because it, they're going to help tell understand, you know, if we were to pull the planes out of the sky tomorrow, if we could snap our fingers and, and stop our emissions, how much warming could we expect just through these natural processes? Um, so that's that's one of the reasons why it's it's important to understand what's happening in the north. What happened at Scotty Creek, the fire, um, the the thaw that's going to follow that fire play into, into these global um, feedback loops. They play into this uncertainty. Now, this permafrost carbon feedback loop is often, uh, you might have heard of it before, it's, it's commonly pops up in the media, often in, in kind of a sensational way. Um, I think the one that makes me cringe the most is, is talk about a permafrost bomb. Uh, this bomb is going to go off in the north because of, of thaw, and that's not, it, it plays nice, it gets lots of clicks. Uh, it's not the most accurate way to describe what's it what's happening. It's not a bomb, um, and and at this it's a positive feedback loop. It's a very important one to understand. But there are also negative feedback loops that are going to help temper it. Permafrost is thawing. It's going to release carbon, but 
vegetation is moving northward, it might absorb more carbon. You know, vegetation takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere for photosynthesis. Um, so, so again, it's we're, when we're thinking about it as scientists, we're thinking about it from kind of the net effect of all of these things going on. And, and that sometimes gets lost in, in the media. And I think that's a shame because um, these sensational headlines, I think they kind of take away a lot of the agency that people would feel. They can kind of make you feel hopeless. I mean, it's, it's um, hard to, to um, cap our emissions. It's painful in a lot of sectors and for a lot of people. So if you're, you're reading headlines about how this bomb is going to go off in the North, I mean, you might think, you know, why bother? Um, but but the truth is that we do have a lot of agency, and and the more we understand these feedback loops, again, the more we can think about how um, we manage our natural resources, how we we manage and work with our environment instead of against it to help us weather the changes that are coming, to help us mitigate the changes that are coming, to help us ad adapt to them. Um, now, I do want to be clear. You know, there's there's no way out of reducing our emissions. It's something that we we have to do. There's I, I can't give you um, an out. There's no escape hatch. We have to do that. But the second part of that is is we can. Once we've done that, we can start to then again think about uh, how these feedbacks work and how we can can prevent some of the the more um, negative projections of climate change and and again how we can we can weather it and how we can mitigate. So there are positive feedback loops and there are negative feedback loops and depending on what we're trying to do, we might be trying to to um, avoid the positive feedback loops and amplify the negative feedback loops. And if we understand what these processes are, if we understand how we work, how they work, then we can start to make some of those decisions. In the case of peatlands, uh, quite simply, peatlands are the largest natural terrestrial carbon sink that we have. So terrestri or northern peatlands are, no, sorry, peatlands in general, not even northern peatlands. Um, these are places where carbon is, is being stored. It's being um, kept on the land surface and, and out of the atmosphere. The flip side of that is that damaged peatlands or degraded peatlands are a major source of greenhouse gas emissions. So when we protect our northern peatlands, we are encouraging a terrestrial carbon sink. And when we manage them poorly and when we degrade them, we are feeding into this positive feedback loop and we are amplifying the, the challenge of climate change. So uh, I've told you why peatlands are important, but I realize I haven't even yet told you what peatlands are. I wanted to get you interested first before I, I kind of dove down into some of the technicals. Um, this is the one of the scientific definitions of what a peatland is. Uh, peatlands are terrestrial wetlands that form when waterlogged anoxic conditions prevent plant materials from fully decomposing. Basically what this means is peatlands are wet. Um, and when you have saturated soils, you don't have oxygen. Anoxic means no oxygen. And these conditions slow down decomposition. So you we still have lots of, of plant production. Again, if you fly over those northern peatlands, there are these vivid colors of, of green and red. And so these are the vegetation, again, it's taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and fixing it into its biomass. Um, when the, the plant starts to die off or that biomass is shed, it's available to be decomposed for microbes and, and that carbon stored in the biomass can be released back to the atmosphere. But when you slow down decomposition, instead of, of um, returning to the atmosphere, that carbon dioxide or that carbon is, is staying in the soil. Now, this picture shows a soil core that was taken from the Great Dismal Swamp in the North, uh, the United States. Uh, that dark brown uh, and, and black color of the soil, that comes from organic matter. It's carbon. So there's, there's um, an awful lot of carbon that is being stored in these soils. And to kind of give you a, a visualization of, of how much, if you, and, and I'm grateful to, to WCS Canada for, for some of these great uh, infographics that I, I'm going to use today. They make my job much, much easier. Um, there's a lot more carbon being stored in peat soils and a lot older carbon being stored in peat soils than you would see in other terrestrial carbon sinks. 
And this, so this is how peatlands can be the most, uh, the largest terrestrial carbon sink, despite the fact that the peatlands globally only cover about 3% of our land surface. Now, this is another uh, graphic that I, I got from WCS Canada. Uh, they really did make my job easier tonight. Um, this is a map of the global extent of peatlands. And what I'm hoping that you take from this when you look at this map is that Canada has an awful lot of peatland here. Like at a global level, we really, really do um, contain significant um, amounts of this, this critically important um, ecosystem type, this, this massive carbon or large terrestrial carbon sink. So when we're thinking about the role that Canada plays in global initiatives to fight climate change, you know, this is a natural one. What we do with our peatlands, how we manage our peatlands are a key part of our story for how we, we um, fight climate change. So it's, it's really a legacy that, that all Canadians do need to look to and, and do need to think about. So let's kind of scale in a little bit. This is a map of um, peatland extent in Canada. Uh, you can see it's largely confined to the boreal ecozone in Canada anyway. Um, the, the darker brown areas, this is where the darker the brown, the more peatland you have. So again, you can see the Hudson Bay lowlands there in northern Ontario and northern Manitoba. Um, Lar one of the globally significant um, peatland you know, that we're fortunate to have right here in, in Ontario. Uh, you can see kind of this, this band that goes through the Taiga Plains down into Alberta. Um, the, here is the Daycho region where I work, if you can see the cursor here. Uh, here is our Alberta oil sands located in, in one of our, our northern peatland areas. Um, Newfoundland has has a fair number of, of peatlands. Uh, Newfoundland's provincial flower is the pitcher plant. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of a pitcher plant before, but a pitcher plant, it's my favorite flower. It's a carnivorous plant. Uh, permafro or sorry, peatland soils tend to be very low in nutrients. So the pitcher plant, just like a Venus flytrap, has adapted to to also to capture insects and and to uh, to feed on insects for lack of a better word as an extra source of nutrients so no offense to the the uh, Ontario trillium but uh, but personally I, I think Newfoundland has the better provincial flower um, but all this to say again we have a lot of of peatland here in Canada and it's largely confined to the north and a large proportion of our northern peatlands lie north of the permafrost boundary. So again, fire and ice. If we want to understand climate change in northern peatlands, we need to think about fire and we need to think about permafrost. So let's start with permafrost. There are two different modes of, of permafrost to think about. The first is active layer deepening. And this is a gradual process. It's fairly easy to incorporate into, into models. Um, and active layer deepening. So you, wherever you have permafrost, there's going to be a layer of soil above that permafrost that does undergo freeze-thaw cycles. And we call that layer the active layer. So as the temperature warms, as the growing season gets longer, that active layer gets deeper and deeper. So the active layer is where you have processes like decomposition going on, nutrient cycling, water transport, that's going to happen in the, in the active layer. So as the active layer gets deeper, um, that's going to influence how, how the, um, the ecosystem responds. Again, gradual process. It's one that, that climate modelers have a fairly good handle on. Um, what's more difficult to model, and, and what a lot of the focus is for those of us who work on permafrost thaw and, and its potential linkages to, to carbon, uh, is what we call thermokarst. And this is an abrupt process. So thermokarst is caused by melting of ground ice. So where you have permafrost that has a lot of ice, when the permafrost thaws, that ice is going to melt and you're going to get ground subsidence. Uh, you know, ice, um, solid water takes up a higher volume than liquid water. So when ice melts, the ground collapses. 
And thermocarst can look like, well, it can take a lot of different, a lot of different forms. Probably one of the most dramatic forms of thermocarst is shown here in this picture. It's a retrogressive thaw slump. So this is where you have thermocarst occurring on, on a hill slope. So the ground, again, the ground is caving in. And because it's on a slope, that material, it's essentially acting like a landslide. So all of that sediment is going to, to move down slope and end up in, in the rivers, lakes, and, and oceans. It's less common in peatlands because peatlands tend to be very flat. Uh, lake expansion is another example of thermocarst. So when thermocarst happens around the margins of a lake, the ground subsides, the lake expands, and it's quite common to see these areas along the margins of lakes where you have drowned trees. Um, this picture here is from, from a lake near, near Yellowknife that had lots of evidence of, of thermocarst along its shoreline. The opposite can happen. Lakes can drain. Uh, this is a picture of um, what was a lake that I used to sample quite regularly up in, in the Western Canadian Arctic in the Mackenzie Delta region. So this is a lake that, that my colleagues and I have been visiting for, for more than a decade. So we're, we're flying out to this lake. We'd been there the year before. We've got the GPS out and, and we're looking at the GPS and we're looking down and we don't see the lake. Uh, instead, what we see is this large mud flat because the lake drained away in probably what was a matter of, of hours. Um, so what can happen is if you think of permafrost as like a plug in a bathtub, if that thaws or if that melts, so, uh, if the ice melts, if the permafrost thaws, now the water has somewhere to go and it can drain away. This can happen slowly, but, but often it tends to happen catastrophically. It can happen over a period of several hours. Um, and there's some pretty impressive videos uh, kicking around the internet of, um, of lakes draining. And, and one of them was taken by, by a colleague of mine in the Northwest Territories. So if you, if you look at, if you Google lake falling off a cliff or um, lake drainage, you'll probably come, come to that video. It's quite, quite impressive. Um, and lastly, the picture that I already showed you from, from Scotty Creek, this is called wetland thermocarst. And it's that process by which um, trees or, or forests can be converted into wetlands because the soils become waterlogged and can no longer support trees. So thermocarst, again, they're, they're abrupt processes and then they can be tricky to, to incorporate into these global models, um, global climate models rather, for, for a number of reasons. Um, to begin with, we don't really even have accurate maps of where we have lots of ground ice. You know, if you want to know how much thermocarst you're going to have, you need to know how much ground ice you have. Um, and, and also because, you know, these abrupt um, thaw events, these abrupt changes to the landscape can also... Um, cause kind of knock-on effects that, that we don't really understand. You know, seemingly small changes can have really, really big effects at a landscape scale and, and the mechanisms aren't always clear. So I, to give you an example, uh, this is uh, an area of the Northwest Territories that I've been working in, in the Daycho region of peatland complex, uh, known as the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. And in the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary, what you basically had is these tiny shallow lakes, and in some cases not even lakes, just, just literal puddles, undergo massive expansion to, to the point where the, the amount of water coverage on the landscape doubled within a period of years. So imagine, imagine how much water you currently have in, in York region and, and double that in a period of a couple of years. What would that look like? Uh, well, in the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary, it looks like large areas of drowned vegetation. So here I have a sedge meadow. Um, this is an aerial shot that shows a large expanse of drowned forest. And I'm not really sure why this happened. <laughs> so uh, I've studied it. Uh, you know, we, we showed that um, the expansion is, is quite significant. Um, it's plausibly linked to climate. It's, it's really unlike anything that's been seen uh, at least over the last several hundred years. You have hunting cabins that have been in people's families for generations that are now sitting in the middle of a massive lake. Um, and it, we think that it's connected in some way to, to wetland thermocars, but we don't really know how. But these changes in, in, in how water moves on a landscape that's thawing um, in a really flat landscape you know, these, these seemingly small changes can have really big dramatic effects. So now you have, uh, you know, 
people who live here travel along the land is very difficult. Um, this land, this area is called the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. So there is a very clear conservation, species conservation link here. Uh, this is a photo that I took while driving along the highway um, through the Bison Sanctuary. So it's the only highway from Yellowknife and it flow, it, you can drive south from Yellowknife into, into Alberta and then west over to, um, to, to Fort Simpson. And, and this is a common sight when you drive along that highway. It's, it's a really impressive sight. You know, you can see just herds of, of wood bison scattered along the highway. So wood bison are the, the larger relative to the plains bison. These are massive animals. So you drive along the highway and you have herds of them running alongside and, and the ground shakes. Uh, it's a little nerve <laughs> nerve wracking to drive your car through there because they're they're all over the road. Uh, you know, you you drive through there and you think, you know, it could take me a few hours to get Fort Port Providence, or I could be there for eight hours if if you know the bison decide to come on the road and I'm not going anywhere. Um, very very neat place to be. Um, but what's happening this this lake expansion that's occurring in the sanctuary is having very real effects for for the wood bison and where you find wood bison. So again, this is the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. Uh, this kind of it's it's a protected area that was set aside to try to reestablish a disease-free herd of of wood bison in the Northwest Territory. So you might have heard of Wood Buffalo National Park. Uh, it's it's located further south. It kind of spans the border of Alberta and the Northwest Territories. Um, the the wood buffalo or the, the wood bison in Wood Buffalo National Park are infected with brucellosis and tuberculosis. So the idea was to establish the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary and separate those populations, that population from, from the wood buffalo population further south. So this river here at the, the southern margin of the territory, the Mackenzie River, um, if you go south of the Mackenzie River, you're in the, the bison exclusion zone. So any bison from either side, from north or south, that wander into that exclusion zone are shot on site because they don't want those herds mixing. They want this herd to stay disease-free. Uh, it's a little bit of a challenging kind of um, um, management, wildlife management task. So the sanctuary was established in 1975. Uh, that dashed red line shows the, the borders of the protected area. That's the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary. So it's established in 1975. Uh, the population starts to grow, and, and you start to see that as the population grows, its range expands outside the sanctuary. Uh, but then by 2008, what you start to see is they're not just expanding their range outside of the sanctuary. They seem to be avoiding the core area of the sanctuary. And by 2012, you know, you're much more likely to find bison outside of their protected area than you are to find bison inside their protected area. Uh, and this seem, and, and we think that this is because of this large-scale lake expansion. So this flooding of sedge habitat, sed sedge meadows, this is important habitat for wood bison. Um, so as they lose their their preferred habitat, they're moving outside the the, the sanctuary, and now you have a, a wood bison sanctuary with no wood bison in it. Um, so again, the the changes that that are happening in in the boreal zone, like they they really do, like they're just a fundamental kind of reorganization of how the land works. It's um, it's it's quite dramatic. Again, you know, those of us who work in the north understand very well. Um, how how kind of all encompassing climate change can be, and and of course you know now as the effects are being felt more in, in southern areas, people are starting to to catch up. But but again, really, it, it permeates all all aspects of life in the north. Now in 2014, um, a large fire went through the Mackenzie Bison Sanctuary and and surrounding areas. Uh, it was a very, very bad fire season for the Northwest Territories that year. Uh, communities had to be evacuated. I was driving along the highway again um, this summer for the first time, um, passing through Port Providence for the first time since that fire. And it really was like the scale of it. It was just kilometer after kilometer of, of burn stands. Um, so it, it, again, you know, when you think about climate change and the boreal, fire and ice, permafrost thaw and, and fire, and fire, forest fires, again, forest fires have always been a really important part of the boreal forest. It's a, a key disturbance in the boreal forest that maintains diversity. It's, 
it's fundamental to the function of the boreal forest that the trees are are adapted to it but what's happening now is those fires are are burning more intensely and they're burning more frequently and and we're starting to see a real change in the fire regime of the boreal forest um and and again that if we're thinking back to to our our global biogeochemical cycles that connect the north to markham um, scientists estimate, you know, the carbon loss from from boreal fires, the equivalent to 278,000 cars over their lifetime. So the fire itself can release a lot of carbon. The changes to the landscape that occur as a result of it can release a lot of carbon. But again, if we're thinking about fire, you know, yes, carbon is an important part of the story, but also people live here. Um, Fire can be be devastating to to the communities who who live in boreal zones. They can have a real um, psychological, social health, financial financial cost. So you probably didn't hear about the 2014 fire season in the Northwest Territories, but but I'd be willing to bet that that at least some of you remember the Fort McMurray wildfire of was it 2015 or 2016, and of course more recently um, the the fire in BC that that followed the the heat dome that BC experienced. Um, and and like if you think back to the the Fort McMurray fire, the the footage coming out of that, the pictures were really quite something. You know, these boreal towns. There's one highway in and out. Um, so when you have a fire that that in in this case it jumped the river, it caught up much faster than people were expecting, and then you had a mass exodus. You know, imagine being in in gridlock traffic, which is something those of us here in the GTA know well. But there's a burning inferno at at the side of the road, and and you can imagine what. Um, what this was like for the people who who had to to endure this so fire is something that that we really need to start taking seriously and it's not just going to be a climate change story climate change is going to make intensity and frequency worse but the reality is that we've also put ourselves in a position where we're much more vulnerable to fire through decades of, of fire suppression activities fire mismanagement and it's long past time for for us to learn how how to live with with fire and think about what that means And kind of the last part that I, I wanted to to bring home and kind of tied to this, again, it's not just, you know, what's happening to the land, there are people who live there. Um, this is a map of, again, here, this is the map I, we saw already. Again, thank you again, WCS Canada. Uh, you see our distribution of peatlands in Canada, and this time road infrastructure is, is overlaid on top of that. And you see the road networks extending into the north. Some of these, these roads service communities, but a lot of them service uh, mines and other resource extraction activities. And this red line here, this is below the red line, that's where 72% of the Canadian population lives. And a lot of the, the money and the resources that are extracted from the north are going to flow south below this red line. Uh, so I put this up here as a reminder that when we're talking about um, climate change effects in the boreal, again, this is not happening in isolation. The, the changes that we're, we're, the way that we manage our natural resources is going to play into those feedback loops. It's going to play into how severe the effects of climate change are. So the reality of this is that the decisions that affect the large majority of Canada's landmass are being made by uh, the population that lives below this red line. We're the voter base. We, in a large part of the way, we, we set the agenda. Um, so I think that, you know, as, as Southerners, um, we have a responsibility to, to look North every once in a while and, and hear from Northerners and, and try to understand how the decisions that we make and the priorities that we set impact um, this Northern heritage that, that we have a responsibility to, to steward. And, and again, the, the people who are most affected by, by the impacts of climate change. Uh, but I don't want to end on on kind of a dour note. Um, I prefer to end on a positive note. Um, I don't think we just have a responsibility to to look north. I think looking north can also be um, a source of inspiration to us. You know, I, I spend a lot of time in the north. I spend a lot of time working with northern communities. 
Um, and, and these are communities that uh, have a lot of, of um, grit and determination. They have a lot of ideas. Um, they have a lot of clear thinking about how everything links together, the environment, climate change, health, the economy. Um, and they have ideas and they have solutions. And, and again, you know, when I work in the North, um, you might think that, that, you know, it can be a little bit depressing to see how fast everything's changing to see, you know, the effects it's having on, on people, but it, it actually is, is increasingly positive because again, I'm, I'm, um, caught up by the energy of, of, of Northerners to, to fight for, for their, their, um, communities to, um, look for ways to mitigate, look for ways to, to adapt. Again, the, the, energy that you get from these northern communities is is largely one of what can we do it's solutions oriented it's positive and it can be really um really uplifting to to you know those of us who who um, spend a lot of time up there so i i started my talk with a story about the fire at the scotty creek research station and and i want to end again by by talking about that fire because um, I, I kind of introduced it as as um, an illustration of of kind of the devastating effects of of climate change, but I don't actually think that that's going to be the story that that ultimately emerges from the fire at Scotty Creek. I think the final story that we're going to see from this fire at Scotty Creek is one about um, collaboration and and determination. So to give you a little bit more background about Scotty Creek, in so Scotty Creek began as, as a government and then a university field station, um, but over, over decades of, of um, collaboration and, and partnerships with um, Northern Decho or the Decho First Nations, um, in the summer, the summer of 2022, the station, the lease transferred over to the Little Quay First Nation. So it went from being a university run field station to an indigenous led research park. So it became a site where world class research was taking place. Um, the knowledge and the questions, research questions, goals were being co produced by scientists and the communities affected by, um, by the changes that are happening. It became a site where you know, university students from Southern universities could come together and, and meet with elders and, and high school students, youth in the day show, uh, learn from one another. And, and you know, it, it, it uh, <laughs> we came together in, in the summer and, and there was a celebration, there was some news articles, and then a few months later it burned to the ground, <laughs> which is a little bit of a setback. But what's emerging from that, again, is now we are working together to rebuild the station. And, you know, this station has hosted students and researchers every year since it was initiated in the 1990s. And we thought that this year would be the first year that that, that wouldn't happen. But it's looking like, you know, because of this, this determination, this leadership from the LKFN, um, partnership between between scientists and community members. It, it looks like there will be at least some infrastructure on the ground to support um, small scale field activities by by early summer, which is just incredible when you think about the scale of of loss here. Um, that that is such a rapid response, and I can tell you, if it was a university run research station, you wouldn't see boots on the ground for for years. I mean, universities are like big tankers. You don't maneuver them very easily. But the benefits of having this being an Indigenous-led research park is, is the response has been really, really rapid. So again, we're, we're the disruption to the long-term research that's been going on here is, is um, going to be minimized. And, and not only that, you know, we have decades of pre-fire data from Scotty Creek as a foundation to really understand how fire transforms a landscape. Like this will be the um, world-class knowledge that comes out of this fire event. And it's it's largely been um, the, the reason that we're able to turn lemons into lemonade is because of, of again, this, this partnership and this um, you know, relationship that has been built up between Southern researchers and, and Northern communities. We can do things that, that were not possible before this. And, and again, it's, it's this common spirit. It's people working together to, to a collective goal and it can make 
daunting tasks, you know, it, it feels like you can you can move mountains. So again, look north um, because we have a responsibility. We we make decisions that affect the north. Um, but again, look look to north look north for for inspiration if if you're feeling uh, maybe a little bit uh, um, hopeless some days. I, I would say that there's a lot going on that that can kind of counteract that mood. So with that, I'm going to end and I'm going to leave you with this uh, picture of, of a rainbow over Goose Lake at the Scotty Creek Field Station. So thank you for listening. And, and I'd be happy to take um, to take any questions. You can you can unmute yourself and, and ask or if you're more comfortable. Uh, there's also a, a chat option.